Plan books for my wood models are available at Amazon. The links are in the description. The plans for today's project are also available at Amazon. The plans have both imperial and metric dimensions, as well as the drawings for both a plywood and a hardwood build. There's a link to the book in the video description, as well as links to the hardware that I used. This is my new scissor lift table. The tabletop is 24 inches wide and 40 inches long. That's about 60 by 100 centimeters and sits at 18 inches or 45 centimeters at the fully lowered position. The table raises smoothly by using the handle to rotate the lead screw. I prefer using a handle instead of attaching a drill or motor. At the fully raised position, it is 70 inches or 178 centimeters high. There are a lot of improvements in my new table over the previous design. My new table uses a double fork for the lead screw carriage so that the pulling force isn't just on one end of the wheel axles, but instead pulls from both sides of each of the scissor arms. Later in the video, I will go over building this fork in detail. I designed a reversible handle so that the lead screw can be turned even if there's a large object on the table that overhangs the edges. The bolts received a serious upgrade from the old design. The old table used plastic tube for bushings. The new table uses sections of steel tubing. My previous table was made from cheap plywood. The new table is made from ash slabs that I bought a couple of years ago for exactly this project. I will be referencing part numbers throughout this build, which correspond to part numbers in the book, just in case you happen to have the book and are building this table for yourself. I am going to skip almost all the cutting and part shaping in this video, because I really want to focus on the table assembly. And besides, there are enough Watch Me Use a Table Saw videos on YouTube already. So let's just assume all the boards are cut and planed, so we can move on. To begin assembly, there are two F3 rails on the top frame and two on the bottom frame. All four F3 rails are cut to the exact same correct length and glued onto the F1 frame beams centered as you can see here. One set on the bottom frame and one set on the top. On one end of each of the long F1 frame beams, a hole is offset from the rails that were just installed. The dimensions for these are all in the book. It is important to note that only one end of each of the frame beams needs this hole. The F2 frame ends are all cut to the exact same length. The two of the holes are for the top frame and are clearance for the lead screw. The frames themselves can now be assembled. The F5 beams can now be trimmed and glued into place on the frames. I forgot to turn on the camera, but you can see here where they are. One of the F5 beams gets a bevel cut into it before it is glued into place. This is to make sure it will not conflict with the lead screw carriage. The bottom frame has the W1 wheel mounting plates glued onto the bottom at each corner. This helps reinforce the corner joint and also serves as a place to mount the casters later. All of the frame joints are now reinforced with wood dowels. I wanted a nice dark contrasting color for the dowel pins, so I made these from some scrap jar of wood that I had. With all the corner joints reinforced, I can now trim any excess off the long frame side beams. 
frames are now finished and we can move on to the scissor arms. For the F6 scissor arms, my ash slabs were not thick enough, so each arm is made from two pieces of ash glued together. Accuracy on the scissor arm holes is critical. First, I find the exact center of a single F6 arm. I also mark out the location for one of the end holes, but not the other. This is important to locate only one end hole. The center hole and the single end hole are drilled through on only this one F6 scissor arm. Now a second F6 arm is aligned and clamped underneath the drilled part. The existing center and end holes are used as guides to drill through the part below, again only on the center and one end, but not the other end. Using a dowel through the center holes, the top part is rotated 180 degrees and then reclamped. Now the single hole at each end can be used as a guide for drilling the rest of the way through. Using this method will ensure that the holes on both parts aligned with each other and they also aligned end to end. Now either of these two drilled parts can be used as templates for drilling the other six. With all of the holes drilled, I can cut the final shape into the first F6 arm and simply use it as a template for the rest. I now need to make the bushings. I used steel pipe for this. As a side note, I have no capacity in my shop to ream out or turn down the diameter of metal rod, so I purchased the steel pipe and drill rod that I am using for the bolts to the exact dimensions I needed so they would work together without any modification, except for threading and cutting to the correct lengths. Links for the hardware that I used are in the video description. My drilled holes are three thousandths of an inch undersized for the steel pipe. I could probably force them into place, but I prefer an easier fit, so a few rounds with a fine grit spindle in each hole works perfectly. Next I will make the P1 pivot blocks that will attach the scissor arms to the frame. There are six thick blocks and two thin ones. I make sure everything aligns perfectly before proceeding. Next I build my wheels. I use two bearings in each wheel and then cut and sand them to the correct diameter. Now that the pivot blocks and the wheels are finished, I can cut the wheel riser strips. These strips need to be the correct thickness so that the wheel center line aligns with the pivot block hole center line. It is important to note here that we are only putting these strips on the top frame. The bottom frame will also get riser strips, but they are done much later for a specific reason, but we'll get to that. I wanted to make my own bolts for this table so that I could have threads on both ends with a smooth shaft in the middle to go through the bushings. I am using drill rod for this. 
I also cut a screwdriver slot into each end so that I can grip it to tighten lock nuts on the other ends. Next I will assemble the two sets of scissor arms so we can do a partial assembly and correctly position the pivot blocks that connect the scissor arms to the frames. When assembling the scissor mechanism, I use regular nuts for now. I will use nuts with nylon inserts for final assembly, but for now parts come on and off for a while and I don't want to wear out the nylon on the lock nuts. The connections on the bottom frame are done with two of the double thick pivot blocks for each scissor arm and the hardware shown. To correctly set the horizontal position of the bottom pivot blocks, I tape a washer to each of the single thick pivot blocks that will be used on the top frame. These blocks get placed between the frame and the scissor assembly, and the whole assembly slid up against them. Once the bottom pivot blocks are dry, the scissor assemblies are detached and flipped over onto the top frame, which is upside down for this step. The top pivot blocks are then attached to the scissor arms. You will notice that the thinner pivot block, the same ones we used as spacers earlier, are positioned closer to the frame sides. There is also no washer on the outer face of the thinner pivot block since this bolt end needs to fit into the side holes that we drilled into the frame. With all of the pivot blocks now glued into place, I also drill and glue in dowel pins. Next we will be installing the F8 crossbeam and the two F10 reinforcing blocks near the bottom wheels. These F10 blocks 
We'll need some shaping before they fit in correctly. Now we will install three of the F7 cross braces between the inner sets of scissor arms. There is a fourth F7 brace, but that can't be installed until after we build the lead screw carriage. The lead screw has a bearing at each end where it passes through the frame. These bearings are held in the B1 bearing blocks with each bearing having a hardwood collar. The hardwood collars are each made in two layers. The top layers have holes drilled into them. One will fit the tapered bearing on the handle end and the other will fit the straight bearing on the opposite end. The second layer is then glued underneath the first, and this bottom layer will also have holes drilled into them. The bottom layer hole leaves a ridge which supports the outer ring of the bearings while allowing the bearing center to freely rotate. To make sure the bearings align with the holes on the frame, I use the frame hole itself to mark the B1 bearing plate hole locations. The hardwood bearing collars then get sanded to fit into the B1 bearing plate holes. To ensure the bearing plates stay aligned with the frame holes, I wrap a piece of dowel with clear tape so that it fits tight into the holes of the frame. I can then slide the bearing plate on and know that the bearing and the hole in the frame stay aligned. This plate then gets glued into place to the frame. It is time to move on to the lead screw carriage. The forearms that make up the two forks of the carriage are part C3. To begin, I tape two washers onto the inner two C3 blanks and place them between the inner set of scissor arms on the wheel end. The C1 and C2 parts are then trimmed to fit exactly in between the two C3 parts. The C4 beam that goes along the top of the carriage then gets the C1 block we just trimmed glued to the bottom of it, centered as you can see here. Once the glue is dry, a large washer divot is drilled right in the center of the C1-C4 block, then the clearance hole drilled the rest of the way through. <laughs> 
Using the center of the clearance hole just drilled, we can find the center of the C2 plate. That center is used to make a hexagonal hole to fit a lead screw nut. We will get back to this part later. The holes in all four C3 arms need to align. After drilling those holes, the inner C3 arms have a notch cut into the top so that they fit underneath the C4 beam. All four C3 parts can now be cut to shape. You will notice that the outer two arms are shaped differently than the inner two. Although I don't usually show it in videos, I always do multiple test fittings of parts before ever gluing anything. On my table, I needed to slightly sand the front edge of the C4 beam so that it didn't conflict with the scissor arms below. Before gluing on the outer carriage arms, I want to make sure I reinforce the inner arms with dowels, both through the side and through the top. With all the pins in and sanded down, I can finally install the carriage and the upper wheels. I now reattach the top frame and slide the lead screw through the bearings. With all of these parts in place, I can thread on the C2 hex nut plate made earlier. If you are building your own, make sure the large washer is in place in the divot we drilled before, before gluing this C3 plate on. Now that the carriage is installed, I can shape the last of the C7 cross beams. This beam needs to fit in underneath the carriage when the table is fully lowered. As you saw earlier in the video, I wanted a double jointed handle on this table. There are quite a few measurements to make and a lot of smaller parts, and I'm not going to go over all of them, but I think the end result is really worth the effort. I find it easiest to install the handle onto the lead screw if I remove the lead screw from the bearings first. <laughs> 
the two protruding pins that mount the handle onto the lead screw. We'll get trimmed down later after I make sure everything works. Time to move to my garage to finish up. Remember those two wheel riser strips that we didn't install earlier onto the bottom frame? Time to do them. I waited until now because I want the thickness of those riser strips to accommodate any sag. About 1 8 inch of height difference here is because the bottom riser strips aren't in yet. However, I have about 3 16 of an inch difference, so I will make those bottom riser strips a little thicker so that the table sits level at my average working height. The tabletop is straightforward. I measure out and countersink all my screws to attach the tabletop. I also countersink very short black screws to attach the MDF hardboard wear surface, and I'm done. Well, I hope you enjoyed this video and found it helpful if you were building this for yourself. And if you aren't building it, the plans for this table are available at Amazon, if you're interested. The links for the book and all the hardware that I used are in the description. Thanks for watching.